Thanks, everyone. Good morning, and thanks for the opportunity to present on this topic today, something I'm very passionate about. At Merck, we've been working on long-acting implants for a long time. I think there are lots of other companies working on other aspects of long-acting injectables, and there's, this, there's another talk uh, after the break I'm, look, I'm looking forward to. I will be focusing mostly on implants, but give you a little background on that. And when I do that, I just want to emphasize that this is our experience at Merck. Uh, of course, when we look in the public domain, there's only so much information that's shared. Uh, so if anyone has other perspectives, I'm very open to them and I'd like to hear them because this is an opportunity for us all to learn from each other. Uh, with that, I'll just get started. Uh, so first of all, what is a long-acting injectable? Why would you go to the trouble of making one? Well, the first thing that comes to mind as a long-acting injectable is a long-acting reversible contraceptive product called Nexplanon. And at a basic level, this is a two millimeter diameter rod, 40 millimeters in length, that slowly eludes a, a, a contraceptive hormone. So it's just, it's, it's, a, it's the size of a matchstick and it's injected under the arm. But on another level, it's actually peace of mind. The patient doesn't have to worry about taking oral contraceptive tablet every day. And in clinical studies, we're able to show that it's more effective than oral contraceptives, partly for that reason, but also just the dose is more consistent, the, the blood exposure is more consistent over time. So that's why one of the main reasons that we would invest time and energy in making long-acting injectables certainly is more complex than a lot of other dosage forms. So like I mentioned, consistent therapeutic exposure, you don't want to have a lot of highs and lows, you, it's, it's critical to get within a specific therapeutic index, you want to improve patient compliance, particularly in that contraceptive example, that's, that's very helpful, but there are many others, for example, with schizophrenia or opioid cessation therapy. This is very important that the patient doesn't have to worry about taking the medicine all the time in order to maintain uh, effective levels. Overall, there's potential to reduce the health system costs, and I think this is kind of, uh, this is a gray area. I think this is where the value proposition could use a lot more development, but a huge opportunity for us as an industry. When we start to think about public health concerns like prevention of malaria or, or helminths uh, or other uh, infectious diseases, there's, there's an opportunity that patients can get, a, get an implant that would last for years and then they don't have to go back to the clinic and get more repeat treatments. I'd say also in, in other contexts where you have an injectable that has to be infused, for example, or administered every few weeks, then there's an opportunity there as well because it certainly takes a lot of time and energy to go to the hospital or the care clinic and get that infusion. And then even for daily administration, I mean, obviously a tablet is preferred by many people and it's very convenient, but it's, there's, a, there's a lot of hassle. I've gone, I've gone to the doctor and gotten the refill for my medicine, you know, the 12th time, and it's the same conversation, and then I have to go to the pharmacy, and then I have to drive home. Anyway, there's lots of opportunity for, for making this more efficient, and perhaps if an implant is something a patient's comfortable with, they could avoid all that. Uh, there's, there are also opportunities for localized site-specific drug delivery, and I think this is, this is uh, just starting to emerge as, as a great option for pain treatments, oncology treatments. At the site of a tumor excision, you might want to add additional chemotherapeutic drugs to prevent recurrence of a tumor. Uh, for pain in particular, joint pain, there are treatments now already approved that slowly elute steroids in, in say, a knee joint. Uh, to reduce the pain. So there are huge opportunities there. And then specifically, when you look at ophthalmic indications, there are at least two products approved that elute a steroid inside the eye. The standard of care for some, some ophthalmic indications is actually an injection in the eye, and there are drugs that are designed to have a much longer duration of therapy. But certainly, to, I think we all agree that the fewest number of injections in your eye, the better. So uh, there are lots of opportunities here to make long-acting injectables. And these take different forms. I think, I think you, you've, seen, you've seen these if, you're, if you've done a, a preliminary look at the field, but it's interesting they can take microspheres are many products, coatings onto stents to, to prevent restenosis, things like that. In situ gelling implants, these have the advantage of being injectable through a needle. I'm going to talk a lot about implants, which are basically fibers or, or, or rods, API suspensions, the, there'll be talk on that topic, and I think when you have the right API, this is a great option uh, when you get the long, um, when you can make a suspension that would 
of an insoluble drug particularly, then you can get a very long profile. And there's an older technology that uses oil, oily depots. So there's certainly trade-offs, and, and it depends on what you're trying to do. Many of these do, do turn out to be combination products, so you can introduce functionality, for example, that coating. You could also use the polymer properties to make um, so take advantage of those polymer properties to make something that's flexible or has a mechanical property to it to aid in the drug delivery. So I'm not going to uh, belabor this point, but I just want to highlight a couple things here. Uh, and there are two tables in the next couple slides. I want to highlight first that these are not niche products. The sales here are, are in some cases substantial, uh, particularly for, for schizophrenia treatments. There are, there are many billions of dollars in sales and they represent the standard of care in many cases. They've demonstrated that patients are able to avoid um, serious adverse events, and also, in some cases, um, jail time and uh, institutionalization. So this, is, this represents a big change in care. I, I will also highlight a couple things here that the injectable non-implant formulations tend to have a shorter duration, though I see that changing, right? So, uh, if you look at the frequency here, the frequency table, we're talking about month, at the most a few months, uh, but the, there have been recent products that are more like six months so, based on insoluble drugs. So uh, it's great to see that change uh, because, of course, injecting a suspension would be through a smaller needle and that would be advantageous. I'll highlight here, these are the implant products. Again, these are not niche products. In some cases, they are for orphan diseases, so the sales aren't, aren't great. You know, they aren't huge quantities, but certainly uh, very important for those patients. The other, the other aspect here is generally the frequency of dosing is, is quite a bit less. You can, some of these last for several years. I, I think in, in, you look at all, this, all these products together, you'll, you'll see a few classes of, ther of, of uh, therapeutic areas, and also that the drugs are quite very, very potent. Of course, you need to be able to fit uh, enough drug to last this long in, in a product. So, all right, so what types of materials do we use for implants? Now, there are lots of constraints, certainly more than your average oral excipient. Uh, you wanna make sure that they're biocompatible and for the whole duration of therapy, in fact. And not just that, they have to be biocompatible in in conjunction with your product as it's been manufactured. So it has to not react with the drug and cause something else to form that would be non-biocompatible. You have to be able to meet the desired re release profile consistently. This can be very challenging. The, it, the excipients have to be low bio burden and toxin free, of course, they're being injected. Uh, they have to be sterilizable. So some polymers in particular will cross-link and they'll have slower release or the chains will break and they'll have faster release. It's something that should be considered throughout your development. They, of course, have to be compatible with the drug. They have to be produced consistently. So in some cases, if you have, say, a custom polymer, it can be a challenge to make sure that it's reproducibly made. Um, certainly, there are approaches to do that better. And then, of course, it would be great if they were inexpensive. But, you know, there's, there's only so much you can ask for. Uh, so generally speaking, we see that people use po polymers for this purpose, and there are lots of reasons. We are in pharma, so certainly precedence carries a lot of weight. Uh, you don't have to do as much work with the regulator to convince that you're administering something that's safe. You also can work with established vendors who understand our quality standards. I will say also polymers are great because they have the flexibility. You can change the molecular weight, you can change the monomers, you can change the side groups. You can adjust a lot of different factors in order to get the release profile you want. They're very easy to process. That's why almost everything you see around you is made of plastic. Right, it's coating uh, via solvent. You can use emulsions to make microspheres. You can uh, use melt processing, and that's what I'll, what I'll speak to in a minute here, um, and injection molding. There are other approaches you can take in order to make uh, different, different products using polymers. They're very flexible. And there are often multiple suppliers for these. I'd say generally speaking, polymers can be designed in a way that they're biocompatible and have good local tolerability, so it's not as much of a challenge as other material classes. All right. So generally, these polymers will fall into two categories, and you have to make a decision whether you want a biodegradable polymer, something that would just be break down in the body and be absorbed, of course, or biodurable, so that it could be removed. 
And there are trade-offs, of course, when you think about it. It'd be nice, all things being equal, to have a biodegradable material. You don't have to worry about having it removed at the time of the, the next dose. However, a lot of patients may change their mind about the therapy. For example, in that contraception example, uh, a woman may decide that she wants to have a child and have the implant removed. That's very difficult when you have a biodegradable system in many cases. There's also the circumstance where you might have a need to remove the, the implant as a result of some sort of adverse event associated with the drug or some urgent need to stop therapy. So there are trade-offs and certainly this is a decision that needs to be made as you're designing your product. Of course, when you're doing a biodurable system, it has to be removed and so that's more invasive, so you have to consider that. Um, all things being equal, biodurable systems tend to achieve longer durations as well. So that's an advantage. There are many, many different release rate uh, factors in play when you're working with these systems. Drug diffusion through the polymer, the process of the implant itself, particularly in a matrix system, the nature of the polymer is with respect to water uptake and the diffusion of the drug through that, that the water in the polymer or the polymer itself. And then, then we add on the potential for polymer degradation. Sometimes you have polymer degradation followed by water uptake, and then you get changes that, as a result of that. So it it's can be quite complex. So I'll highlight, really just, I'll highlight the most common polymer for biodegradable systems and then uh, allude to some of the opportunities for the future. So biodegradable systems, as I mentioned, the, they break down and they're absorbed by the body. The monomers are absorbed um, and then excreted. Now, when we talk about degrading systems, there are lots of ways that this could go. In, in, in my opinion, one of the better ways it would go would be from the outside consistently towards the middle. Then you can get predictable release and uh, you don't have uh, you have something that's mechanically integral at the end of the life. So that, if you could thread the needle there, potentially you could remove the implant halfway through therapy if there's enough mechanical integrity left. So that presents an opportunity for new materials, really. The other thing that, that can happen is that the polymer degrades consistently, independently of, of its location in the implant, and I haven't seen a lot of examples of that, but that, that might also be able to give you more consistent release. What we tend to see most common, and particularly with PLGA, is that the monomers, which are acidic, they catalyze degradation of the, in, of the PLGA, and they can't diffuse out of the core of the, of the implant. So we start to see a hollowing out. We've seen this in vitro and in vivo. And uh, then you end up with kind of an exterior shell, which maybe as a result of the processing is also denser. So this can be a challenge and something to consider. For, you see this sometimes with microspheres as well, where there's a rapid increase in the release rate, and that's something that you need to either formulate or design around. So like I mentioned, I'll focus on PLGA. So this is very much the most common and has the most options. Uh, there are many suppliers of, of EVA. I'm sorry, PLGA, excuse me. Uh, I'll talk to EVA in a minute. And it's it was, now, 50 years since the first drug delivery patent, and there are more than 40 products using PLGA. So this is where most people start, and it's a good place to start. Uh, they, it is biocompatible, has lots of precedence use. You can adjust the ratio of the monomer. In this pro particular example with Eligard, they were able to demonstrate that they could extend the duration of therapy and all, by increasing the dose, but also adjusting the ratio of lactide to glycolide. So as, as, the, like, as it, the lactide proportion was increased from 50% to 85%, they were able to go from one month to six month duration. So that's just one example and there are several others that, that achieve the same thing. Like I mentioned, there are lots of products using PLGA and they take many different forms. Here's a slide from Tom Tice at Ivonic talking about all the different products. And uh, so there are lots of options and lots of places you can look to for, for opportunities to, uh, places to start and to understand what, what you're working with. Now, of course, there are certainly challenges, as I, I mentioned one of them, with the implant kind of hollowing out. There is, an, there is a high, in some cases, a high internal pH uh, with PLGA as it breaks down, the pH goes down. I'm sorry, a low internal pH, it's more acidic. So there's a potential for degradation of, of the drug. And in some cases, people have added 
basic additives to, to prevent this. There is a challenge in understanding the in vitro and vivo release profile. This tends to be empirical. I will say this is true in many systems, so it's not such a, a, a mark against the PLGA. Um, PLGA tends to be very sensitive to processing and irradiation amongst the polymers that I've worked with. And so you can see here as a function of the dose of, of the sterilization of the radiation, the molecular weight is reduced. So it's, it's something to watch for and something to bear in mind as you're developing this. And also as you process it, the, the amount of shear it's exposed to, the amount of temperature it's exposed to, it causes problems with PLGA. And then there is a potential, since it is acidic, for uh, reduced the local tolerability, so that's something to watch for as well. All that said, these are challenges that can be overcome. They're just things to bear in mind. And there are many products, of course, that use this, so it's a good sign that you will be successful if you use it. There are many others available, other biodegradable polymers available. Academic labs are working in this area. Like I mentioned, it would be wonderful if we had something that would degrade from the surface in and maintain mechanical integrity. That is very difficult to design in as a functionality of polymers. So hopefully in the future we will see that. At the moment we have these options shown here. And um, I'll just highlight a couple here. Uh, polyester amide from one, one vendor is DSM. They're able to independently adjust the enzymatic degradation of the polymer and, and the hydrolytic degradation of the polymer. And uh, polyglycerol subicate is nice. It, it's very flexible material um, because of the, the long sebacic acid uh, chain. It's more, more flexible. And so it's more like a rubbery material. It's been used in lots of different applications. So I'll just press on here and highlight uh, some biodurable polymers. As I emphasized before, there are trade-offs here, so you have to make a choice, biodegradable versus biodurable, what's most appropriate for your product and what you're willing, what you're willing to trade off. Um, there are many mechanisms in play. I won't go over those again. But uh, I will highlight a couple of the polymers that we've worked with at Merck, EVA and TPUs, so polyethylene vinyl acetate and uh, thermoplastic polyurethane. Before I do that, I want to show you a comparison study we did with our drug MK591, and uh, this was in development for HIV prophylaxis. We were uh, looking at the impact of different polymer choice, both in vitro and in vivo, and we wanted to understand whether we, first, whether we could make a system that would be biodegradable that would last hopefully at least a year, uh, ideally longer, uh, and then also to understand what the trade-off was. If the EVA could get a longer duration, if it would be something that we would want to accept that it would have to be removed at the end of therapy. So as we show here, the in vitro release profile and the in vivo release profile in the biodurable system is slower than in the biodegradable system. There are lots of aspects to this I won't go into right now, but overall what we saw is that the diffusion of the drug was less and we weren't having the deg degradation of the polymer occurring in the middle of therapy. Uh, so if you look just to the blue lines, you can see a comparison at the 40% drug load, which is right around the percolation threshold, so bear that in mind. Uh, but as you go from the top to the bottom, the EVA is slowest, and uh, so uh, we ultimately decided to develop that further and take that to the clinic. EVA, this is some promotional material from Selenese. EVA is, is, a, is a polymer that's well established in drug delivery. It's, it's used in Explanon and Nuvering and it's used in uh, several other medical devices. Uh, EVA is a very common polymer in other applications. It's used for hot melt adhesives, so hot glue. Of course, this is a very different material that we're using for implants. It's, it's very clean and, and held to high standards. What's nice about EVA is, is polyethylene and vinyl acetate. Vinyl acetate reduce, reduces the TG of the system makes it easier to process, but certainly polyethylene is quite easy to process. Uh, lots of options, particularly thermal processing here. Uh, so um, here's a short study comparing uh, different in vinyl acetate levels. So this is something that you want to consider. As the vinyl acetate increases, the ability for the ethylene domains to crystallize is reduced. The, inter the vinyl acetate interferes with that crystallization. And so the drug diffusion has changed. So what, what they were able to show, Selenius was able to show in this study, was that 
as they increased the vinyl acetate, they had faster release profile of their model drug niacin. All this to say, if you're developing a product that wants that you, where you want to use this technology, you would want to study the impact of vinyl acetate. That's what we did as well for our product. We looked at other options, including thermoplastic polyurethanes, and uh, those are made by several suppliers, one example being Lubrizol, um, and they're, they're commonly used for medical devices and particularly medical tubing. They have uh, several, several different grades of different uh, hardness, shore hardnesses, so stiffnesses, and uh, have different levels of water uptake. Uh, so lots of options there. And, uh, and I just want to highlight one example uh, for, from uh, a lab at Northwestern where they take high drug loaded pellets and put it in polyurethane tubes. They, attempt, they were attempting to really boost the drug load, and they did so. Uh, the, the tube has to be removed at the end of therapy, but it's an interesting concept. Uh, if you had something that potentially had a long delayed degradation tube uh, in that tube, then maybe there's an opportunity there. All right. So finally, I'll talk a little bit about implant design and manufacturing. Now, there are really two approaches that people take for this, this uh, from a design perspective. One being to make a matrix tablet. Uh, matrix tablet, there you go, matrix implant, uh, where drug is dispersed and dissolved in polymer. Uh, this is a simpler approach. It has some downsides. You tend to see high, rele high re initial release, burst release off the surface because there's a lot of drug on the surface. The drug loading more strongly impacts release rate, particularly as you get above the percolation threshold. Uh, so you need to bear in mind the the porosity of the implant is important, and also the network of the pores as the drug dissolves out. The drug morphology and size strongly, can strongly impact release rate. We, we demonstrate that in our case, uh, and I'll show you that in a minute. Alternatively, you can use a reservoir system, which has a distinct advantage of, of not having as much, nearly as much burst release. Sometimes there's a bit of drug dissolved in that rate controlling membrane on the outside. However, it is more complex to produce. You have to have often two extruders or, or uh, place a core in a tube or uh, do something else to apply the rate controlling membrane, coat it uh, with solvent perhaps. But uh, it, again, it, it has, removes that burst release, but also potentially, I, I mean, if you take this approach, you would want it to have a more consistent release profile. And so you could potentially get to a higher core loading and a longer duration of therapy. So there, again, there are trade-offs. I'll just highlight briefly that there are opportunities to make other, other approaches that are more of a mechanical device nature. And you can see that this adds additional complexity, but has this potential for good control over the release profile and a very long duration of therapy. So this just highlights some of the differences, as I spoke to, between the two design options. The blue line is the burst release is show, shown for the matrix system, and then you start to see that uh, the, as the concentration of the drug inside the implant drops, you can get below the therapeutic level, and so there, there's a tail uh, that kind of drops off. With a reservoir system, you don't see nearly as much burst release, and you have a longer duration, duration at, the, at the desired target. These are just cartoons uh, to show you kind of how this works. So like I mentioned, there are risks to a matrix system. Like it's simpler. You can simply blend and process with one extruder or some uh, or other uh, prototyping tools. But you have to worry about the impact of your drug as it's uh, dispersed through the implant and the particle size of the drug, whether the pores are connected, whether you have enough drug in the system to get a, a full network. And so what we, sh what we did with our with our drug of interest, MK591, was demonstrate that we, we saw the, the drugs dissolve, drug dissolve, particles dissolve from the outside in, and it left behind a, a poor network uh, composed entirely of the matrix polymer, EVA. Um, there were a few, there was a small percentage that wasn't connected to the network, um, so you want to make sure you're above the percolation threshold so you, you get most of the drug out. We went and did another study with our collaborators at Penn State, and we looked at 
uh, you know, since we didn't have the ability to make lots of different particle size of our API, we used calcium carbonate, which is a very common polymer filler, and we investigated the impact of both the size and shape and processing uh, using extrusion versus injection molding. So you can see that on the right. Examples of uh, SEMs of the different calcium carbonate on the top right. And on the bottom right, if you look at that left graph, so that's, I believe, yes, that's injection molded samples. And you can show that, see that there is a big impact of the particle size of the calcium carbonate. And on the right, those are injection molded samples. And we think that there's a, there's a slower release through the injection mold samples because there's additional particle alignment as we, as, I'm sorry, I misspoke. So a slower release through the extrusion samples because there's additional particle alignment as it goes through that die. There's a high pressure shear field and the particles line up along with that shear field. And so you don't have as, enough, as many points of connection through the network. The poor network as the depleted implant is not as connected as with the random orientation you see with injection molded uh, prototypes. So it's something to bear in mind the process, even at the early stage, can impact your release profile. All right. So finally, we've selected our polymer. We've made decisions about the design. We know what we want to do. And we've made a few examples. So we want to actually make enough so that we can dose a few animals and do uh, a lot of dissolution studies and, and stability studies and understand what's happening with this, with this part, with this formulation. We need to precisely control the dimensions of the implant and in the reservoir case, also the, the layer thickness on the outside. And we need to make sure we understand how we're actually gonna administer the implant as well. So we have to do some testing to make sure it can be ejected through, through the device. We need to, we need to de design our process in a way where we blend everything thoroughly, of course, but also don't degrade the drug. And we have good mic control over the microstructure. So like I mentioned, we saw differences as a result of extrusion versus injection molding. That's something that you need to control for and make sure your process is, is taken care of. Um, that you, you can imagine if you aren't paying attention to, say, your extruder, extruder die design, you might have different pressure at that point and then different degree of, of particle orientation and therefore different microstructure and ultimately a different release profile. So it can be quite complex. We want to melt the polymer because we don't want any air bubbles in the implant. Uh, that's lost space. And in addition to interfering with the release profile, it could be uh, you, you might have um, faster release profile than you desire. Of course, we want to avoid degrading the drug or the excipients themselves. Um, there are lots of lab prototyping techniques. I'll highlight one in a minute. And then there are a few more in the backups. If you, but this is an area that where I'd like to see a lot more research to understand how we can go to a prototyping tool like, uh, like the melt prep and, uh, and ultimately predict what will happen at scale. So when we start to do the, the, pro, the pilot scale process, we're using polymer equipment, twin screw extruders, single screw extruders. This is what, what I've seen most commonly and what we used for our product. We were able to, uh, first what we do is disperse the drug effectively in the polymer and produce pellets that are then used as a feedstock for single screw extrusion, which is designed to control the pressure precisely and get a very nice filament. This is ultimately the same process that's used for your string trimmer uh, spool of, uh, of like for plastics for a weed whacker or for your 3D printing uh, filament. It's the same process. You need, you need to precisely control the diameter. Of course, all that has to happen in a clean room with materials that are not at all uh, designed for this. They're designed with other things in mind like the, the formulation performance. They're not designed for polymer processing. So when we start to do this, there are a lot of factors that you have to understand. First of all, uh, you, by this point, you've defined your API properties, ideally. You have defined your drug load, your polymer choice, and you start, start to do, do studies to understand the impact of the process. Now, each time you do this, I'd say you, you probably need at least 200 grams per batch, even as they, the suppliers of this equipment have started to scale it down. 
it can be very challenging to work with less and make, make good predictions about what will happen at scale. So as we start to scale this up, you want to have a reasonable amount of confidence in your ability to make what you want to make again. Um, and for clinical supplies and, and for commercial supplies. So like I mentioned, I want to highlight an, an opportunity here to understand better how to scale this process down. Drug is very difficult to come by and in some cases extremely expensive. And so you want to be able to use very few, a, a very small amount of material. Like I mentioned at pilot scale, we're talking about 50, 100, hundreds of grams. So uh, of a total formulation. Uh, so this is a nice, actually a couple nice papers uh, where they were able to take the melt prep system, vacuum compression molding, and, and this is really nice because you can make, you can remove most of the porosity, but you don't have to make specially designed uh, injection uh, molds in order to uh, get consistent, um, so, which can have a lot of upfront expense. So you have these molds already ready to made, ready made, and there are uh, foils that allow for easy separation of materials. So you can, if, you can actually make prototypes with, with as little as a gram. And uh, what they did here was uh, make those cores and then apply a rate controlling membrane on, on top using the same setup and demonstrate that they were able to predict what they saw with, from a vaginal ring product um, and also to modulate the release rates and, uh, and that will help them define the formulation. So. Of course, there's still challenges as you start to scale this up. You need to make sure that the core is lined up with the, with the sheath. You don't have a narrow uh, membrane, and, so, uh, and there are lots of design aspects to co-extrusion that you have to understand, matching the materials so they stick together, matching the process uh, flow rates so that you don't get variations in thickness. Um, but altogether, it would be wonderful if we had a way particularly for co-extrusion because it, it does require even more material in order to get good control over the core and the, and the sheath um, dimensions and, uh, and uh, also quite a bit more material to develop the process. So with that, I'll summarize a few points here. There is a huge opportunity for long-acting injectables. That opportunity re remains, in, particularly for chronic disease and global health challenges and places where it's difficult to administer drugs. It's certainly more complex than a lot of other dosage forms, it's something uh, that you have to understand from the onset. You can't, um, you can't go to a platform and assume you're gonna get the same results, a platform formulation. You have to do your due diligence and understand the impact of the materials. And uh, it would be wonderful if we could reduce the scale that we do those studies. Uh, I hope to see that over time. Polymer materials are advantageous for this application, and at scale, once we get to that point, they're very helpful when you're trying to make complicated structures consistently, and, and so there's, that's kind of where you're trying to head, like I mentioned. Um, there may be opportunities here for new materials to improve your development prediction, improve the manufacturing process, certainly, and all in all, so we can develop products faster and, uh, and provide them to patients. So with that, I'll thank you all for your attention. I think there's a bit of time for questions. Yeah. Thanks very much, Doug. Any, any quick questions before we move, move on to the break session from anyone? Yes, Pratik. Sure. So for your implants, are you making this in-house or at Merck? Right, so there are, I will say that we make both development and, and uh, you can make GMP batches at, at several CMOs. Um, I cannot say if, oh. if we have this and for capability. The, and for the release plots that you were showing, right? Yes. I mean, it's almost like over a month you're running, right? Almost 50 right. days I was looking at that. Mm -hmm. So this is, could you say like what kind of app you are using, Diesel? Ah, for that, we used, uh, we actually were using scintillation vials in a, in a, oh, okay. in a <laughs> yeah, in a um, incubator. Yeah, but, but other people have used app sevens and, um, and uh, other approaches. Yeah. Thank you, Pratik. And uh, let's give Seth a, uh, another quick round of applause again. Thank you. Thank you.